Welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Liliana Rodenovic for everybody uh, who, for anybody who doesn't know me. Um, I am the leader of the project Science, Faith and Superstition uh, and uh, I'm really happy that you all made it. Uh, all the lecturers, all the students, uh, I'm hoping we are going to have fun and enjoy the talks and uh, have a nice field trip. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, many people, uh, but first I would like to thank our sponsors, uh, Templeton Foundation and uh, Ian Ramsey Center for Science and Religion, because they found this project worthwhile uh, and decided to uh, give us funding. Uh, without them, this would not have been possible at all. Now, there are other uh, three people without uh, uh, which this wouldn't have been possible. That's Petr Nurkic, you probably met him already, Nada uh, Dimic, she, uh, uh, and, and Milan, of course, uh, who is recording everything and who is going to uh, make this look very professional and uh, we'll put it on our website and promote it later on when it's done. So. Um, I hope I didn't uh, skip anybody. Uh, of course, my close colleagues, Dayan and Rastko, uh, who are also researchers on this project, so they contributed a lot, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so uh, today uh, we are opening with the topic, uh, my topic, uh, and uh, I think that somehow it fits well uh, the beginning. Uh, of our two-day workshop uh, because it's sort of general and uh, covers uh, early uh, period of Christianity as well as some thoughts uh, and uh, uh, positions uh, of contemporary philosophers. So what I'm going to talk about today uh, is, as you can see in the title, Petitionary Prayer. Uh, and the reason why I picked this topic is because I think it fits, it ties well uh, to the way uh, we understand the world, we understand the forces that, uh, uh, that uh, work in the world, um, the way uh, we understand science and scientific explanation and what we think superstition is. Uh, so, uh, it kind of reflects all of that. Now, in the title, as you can see, uh, there is another uh, thing that's the petitionary prayer in the disenchanted uh, or enchanted universe, uh, which, will, uh, which says that we are going to talk about the way petitionary prayer was understood in the late antiquity, in pre-modern times, in the time when the world was enchanted, uh, and uh, also uh, uh, petitionary prayer, the way uh, philosophers of the 20th century, 21st century understand it today, uh, that is in our disenchanted world. Of course, uh, uh, the term disenchantment I borrow from uh, Max Weber, uh, and Max Weber uh, wanted to to describe by the term the world we live in. That's the world uh, in which there are no magical forces anymore, there are no angels, there are no demons, uh, nothing whatsoever, no fairies, no trolls, no spirits, nothing magical in it. Uh, the world uh, is operated by mechanical forces, uh, by uh, natural laws, uh, it, and it's completely indifferent to human beings, so to speak. And we'll unpack what that means later on. Okay, uh, now what is petitionary prayer? So the paradigmatic case of petitionary prayer uh, is the one we find in Gospels. Uh, it's the prayer uh, that Jesus prays uh, on the Mount of Olives, right before uh, his uh, re arrest, right before his uh, sufferings and crucifixion. And in that prayer, it's interesting, in that prayer he says, 
And he went, this, this is Matthew 26, 39, uh, famous one. He says, and he went, meaning Jesus went a little farther and he fell on his face and prayed saying, oh my father, if it, po it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but, but as thou wilt. Meaning, uh, please God, uh, if it's possible at all that I uh, avoid this, that I don't go through what's coming, and he predicted what's coming many times uh, before that. Uh, he knew the sufferings that were waiting for him, and now he prays, oh, please God, spare me, but not according to my wishes, only if it's your will, and then make my will be yours will. Um, so, uh, petitionary prayer is certainly something that, uh, in which we pray for a thing, for, uh, for something to happen. Uh, we pray to God to arrange something for us, um, uh, to help us out. Uh, and, uh, but from the early on, it always has this caveat to it, not according to my wish, just that, but according to your will. So there is this caveat to keep in mind. And it's important because all the desert fathers, uh, all uh, priests, church fathers, uh, they all warned their parishioners not to pray uh, for fulfillment of their desires as they are, but just if that's according to God's will. Now, what are the usual? And we have the paradigmatic case here. They get, Please, God, spare me of the sufferings. But what are other things that people usually pray for? Okay. Now, there is one wonderful book the, written by uh, Aldous Huxley. Uh, it's called The Grey Eminence. Uh, and it's a fictional biography of uh, Father Joseph. Uh, and I warmly recommend it. It's a wonderful book. Uh, in that book, uh, we see the biography of Father Joseph, uh, who was a monk, but also who was a minister of foreign affairs uh, to Cardinal de Richelieu. And he was the mastermind behind the Thirty Years' War, one of the bloodiest wars before 20th century. Uh, so he was a political figure, but also a monk. So, uh, uh, what Huxley found interesting here is this struggle between uh, his attempts to be at peace with God, to um, live this contemplative life, and uh, his political actions. Now, uh, the reason I'm uh, starting with him is that uh, at one point in the book, Huxley gives us this funny list, ridiculous list of prayers that Father Joseph uh, had for the God. And not only that he prayed for these things, he also asked Calvarian nuns, the order that he helped out, uh, to pray for the same things. Now, we can take a look what these things are. And now, of course, we find them really kind of even embarrassing. So uh, he's asking that his plan, uh, uh, just a little bit of a background. Uh, uh, there is a context, a context to it. Uh, Father Joseph is at this moment uh, in the military, uh, and they, are, uh, they surrounded uh, the, the, the town, so it's siege, uh, and they are hoping to invade the town, to, to break the siege, and uh, uh, to occupy it. Okay. So Father Joseph is praying that his plan for entering the town by the night through an underground sewer and taking the garrison by surprise happens. So that's what he prays to God. Then he prays to God for the conversion of the Protestant Duke of La Tremoille. Uh, then he also prays to God for an amelioration in the behavior of the king's brother Gaston, for the defeat of the second English expedition, and so on and so forth. So it's kind of a list of um, embarrassing things to ask from God. Now, not to leave uh, Father Joseph alone, I will tell you my own story. Uh, uh, when I was, uh, so, so I did pray to God uh, for ridiculous things, lame things as well. So when I was in my first year, 
uh, of uh, graduate school. Uh, not graduate, sorry. I was undergrad, first year of undergrad, uh, and I was about to take my first exam. Uh, that was Intro to Philosophy, Introduction to Philosophy. I dropped by the church before that, and I went there to ask God to give me one specific set of questions. Back in the days, the questions were written on the slip of paper. Uh, the paper would be covered like this, so you could not really see the questions. And among plenty of those, you would pick one randomly, and then you would answer. So three combinations I knew really well. So I asked for this specific piece of paper with specific questions uh, to get A plus or something. So I go to the church and I pray to God, please God, please God, give me these questions. I come to the exam, I pick up uh, the, 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 the randomly piece of paper, and here they are, the questions I asked for. So, uh, right, I get A plus, so it has happy ending. I go back to church and I say, God, I promise I will never ask for these ridiculous things anymore. Uh, so, uh, and I used to joke afterwards how uh, uh, that was my personal uh, proof for God's existence. Anyway, uh, but yeah, these are, this, this is the ridiculous thing to ask for. Uh, as Father Joseph's were, okay? Now, there are serious things, too, to ask for. Much more important to us. And uh, that's health and our well-being. And people do pray often. Re religious people do pray often uh, to God for their own health, health of their children, health of their parents, for the recovery of uh, a quick recovery of uh, uh, their loved ones. So this is not so funny anymore, and these are the things the most important to us. So when we think about them, this is something religious people do, and we have to make sense, uh, or at least philosophers nowadays want to make sense, uh, how is that possible, and what is the meaning of this kind of prayer? So in the pre-modern world, uh, and we'll talk about late antiquity, more specifically 6th century Gaza and two desert fathers uh, from the 6th century, um, uh, these kind of prayers were more than welcome. With that caveat that we uh, started with, uh, just pray to God for whatever you need. With that caveat, be it uh, be, it the, uh, be it God's will, uh, not your will, and nothing else. But in modernity, the, uh, so uh, 17th century on, uh, another thing uh, became a problem for petitionary prayer. Uh, namely, in that period, uh, uh, scholars, thinkers, uh, philosophers, many started to believe that petitionary prayer uh, does not make sense at all because it asks for impossible to happen. It asks uh, that something supernatural, uh, some force outside of this physical world, intervenes and helps us out. And that's impossible. And the belief that it is possible, they started designated as superstition. Now, one of the goals of this talk is to see how this and why this transition happened. What people in pre-modern times didn't have problems with, uh, uh, people in modern times started to have problems with. Uh, what was possible for the first, it, was, it started to be impossible for the latter. So we'll try to unpack that during this talk. And here is the plan. We'll go in reverse. So we'll start with uh, uh, Dizzy Phillips and Wittgenstein, contemporary philosophers uh, who uh, aim to make sense of petitionary prayer, and with the main goal to differentiate proper petitionary prayer, if there is one, from superstition. Okay? So that's their goal. 
Uh, then we'll go back in time to the 6th century Gaza uh, and we'll explore what the Desert Fathers John and Barsanufius uh, thought about petitionary prayer, how they advised their fellow Christians how to pray, and uh, uh, see how that differs from what contemporary philosophers of the 20th century and on uh, believed. Then we'll proceed and talk about metaphysical confines that dictate, basically, uh, the views on petitionary prayer. Uh, these metaphysical confines uh, differ a lot from pre-modern times to our contemporary modern world, and we'll unpack what's going on there. And finally, at the end, uh, I'll talk about a little bit, I'll suggest that uh, even though our modern world is uh, very uh, materialist, reductive, uh, uh, and uh, seems that it does not allow for the miracles in it, uh, that might not actually be the case. Maybe we can actually revise our uh, metaphysics to, uh, and be open to things like that. Okay, so let's start with Wittgenstein. Uh, uh, Wittgenstein, being Wittgenstein, uh, never really wrote anything extensively about anything. So we have his uh, uh, thoughts uh, spread around uh, that we can reconstruct and uh, kind of make complete. But these thoughts uh, uh, that he uh, uh, wrote are so insightful that can allow us to uh, develop uh, more detailed philosophies out of them. Now, when it comes to religion, uh, he did write here and there uh, about what he thought crucifixion is, what he thought to the proper faith is, and what he thought superstition is. And that was really uh, important to him. Uh, and that can actually tie back to the view of petitionary prayer. Now, this is what he says. He says religious faith, and that's his attempt to make difference between religious faith and superstition. He says religious faith and superstition are entirely different. One of them springs from fear and is a kind of false science. The other is a trusting. What he's saying here is that if we have proper faith, we will have a, a complete trust that God has the proper plan for us. Uh, what, maybe we are not enjoying the plan, but it's good for us nonetheless. So that's the idea. If we fear, uh, if we don't, uh, if we don't have such trust, we are swamped with fears and anxieties about what's going to happen to us. So what we try to do then is we try to rearrange things and we pray God to make this happen and make that happen. And like, we ask for these specific things in the hope to fix the world for us. Now, when we do that, and that's where petitionary prayer comes in, when we do that, uh, we are, according to Wittgenstein, engaging in pseudo-scientific stance. We are engaging, we are taking this pseudo-technological attitude where we treat prayer as the tool that will make something happen. And that's superstition. Okay. Now, it's uh, worth noting that for Wittgenstein, uh, superstition is not just uh, uh, avoiding black cats and similar things. Uh, superstition can be embedded in the proper religious rituals as well, such as baptism, for example. Um, not only baptism, but baptism is the case here. Uh, so, uh, for example, if we Baptize the, get the child baptized uh, so that the child uh, uh, is happy and prosperous and uh, acqu uh, acquires wealth uh, in his or her life. That would be superstition. If we uh, uh, have the child baptized, 
uh, so that the child uh, uh, enters the church, uh, starts to be a member of community, and is on the path to salvation. That would be religious act. Uh, so in order to figure out whether something is religion or uh, superstition, we really need to pay attention to the context, to the motivations of the actors, and so on and so forth. So, so that's what Wittgenstein suggests. He himself, which is interesting, also prayed, and he wrote down some of his prayers during the war, uh, for First World War, uh, while he was uh, on the Eastern Front. And this is one of them. He says, he writes now, uh, how will I behave when it comes to shooting? Uh, I'm not afraid of being shot, but of not doing my duty properly. God, give me strength. Amen. Is this a proper prayer? Is this a superstitious act? Uh, is this just a cry for help? Uh, we have to figure out uh, based on the context. Now, he didn't really comment on this. He didn't say uh, neither here nor later what he was doing exactly when he was praying like this. Uh, but there is his uh, follower, uh, Dizzy Phillips, Wittgensteinian, uh, who did uh, explore further uh, the concept of prayer, including petitionary prayer that can actually make sense of the Wittgenstein's prayer um, uh, that we cited. Okay, uh, Dizzy Phillips uh, wrote the book in 1965. Uh, and that's the book, if you can see, the, the title is The Concept of Prayer, and there is the whole chapter in that book uh, uh, devoted to petitionary prayer. Uh, petitionary prayer uh, is obviously a prayer uh, in which we ask for something. We already covered that, so we ask for this or that in that prayer. Uh, so. Phillips is aware that obviously somehow that prayer already presupposes this faulty causal link between supernatural and natural, uh, and uh, we treat prayer as something that can lead to desired outcome. Now, his goal is to try to make sense of petitionary prayer that escapes this verdict of being superstitious. So that's, that's the goal of the sixth, I think, sixth chapter of his book. Again, as good Wittgensteinian, uh, he uh, wanted to, uh, uh, he tells us that we need to look uh, at, the con at the context to figure out whether something is an act of superstition or proper fate. Uh, so, uh, for, for instance, if, we, uh, if somebody finds themselves in the sinking ship, on the sinking ship or at the airplane that seems to start malfunctioning. So fear overwhelms us and we can hear people praying, oh, please God, save me this time. Please God, save me, uh, save me at least this time. Um, now, is this a proper prayer or not? Uh, uh, Phillips says, if we have to look at the person, if the person prays regularly, every day, um, and uh, negotiates with God these kind of things. Please help me here, please help me there. It might be a sign of superstition. If the person never prays, uh, but only here uh, 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 utters these words, please God help me, it might not be uh, neither faith nor superstition. It might be just some kind of replacement of the cry for help. Uh, or just the expression of the horror that the person is experiencing. But uh, if the uh, person uh, prays every day uh, without this negotiation, the negotiating part, if the person is um, ready to accept whatever the plan uh, God has for him, and if he prays or she prays, the way Jesus prayed uh, on the mountain, or Mount of Olives, then it's a religious act. So context is important. The other things to pay attention to, 
when we try to distinguish between uh, proper prayer and uh, superstitious prayer uh, are as follows. So if we hear somebody uh, upon uh, uh, the failure of the prayer, when the prayer does not lead, uh, yield the desired result, if we hear somebody saying, God, didn't I pray hard enough? Why are you doing this to me? Uh, it's a sign of superstition because obviously a person doesn't know that the prayer or is somehow don't, is, does not understand that the prayer is not you press the button here and the, uh, God delivers. It's not kind of an act or a thing. Uh, praying hard in that sense, praying uh, many times is not something that can guarantee the desired result. Um, we will see uh, Desert Fathers did encourage people to pray hard and pray often, but that's irrelevant over the uh, ending result. The, they encouraged people to accept whatever the result may be. Now, uh, uh, slips of the tongue. If somebody prays and then forgets the words, and then uh, starts with another verse or with another line, and then he's totally anxious, uh, anxious or she is anxious uh, about uh, uh, that slip of the tongue. Obviously, they treat the prayer as an incantation, uh, casting a spell, where the word order matters, as if that's some kind of secret mechanism once uh, in place, will, that once in place will deliver the result. And that's superstition, not a proper prayer. But what is then the meaning of petitionary prayer according to D.Z. Phillips? Uh, why people pray? Why they ask from God anything? And he says, it is true that God's will can be found in whatever happens, but the prayer of petition is best understood not, not as an attempt at influencing the way things go, but as an expression of, and that's him being Wittgenstein really, uh, and a request for devotion to God through the way things go. So to make the peace with how things go. Or in other words, but why pray for a specific thing then? Uh, that's the question. Uh, after all, it is these desires, Philip's answers, it is these desires and not any others which threaten to overwhelm him and through which he must seek God. So basically he says, most prayers, if they are proper prayers, could uh, be, uh, thy will be done. Uh, but people do ask for specific things in their prayers because that's the easiest way for them to connect with God and to God's will. And that's pretty much it. So uh, that's his explanation of petitionary prayer and he finds the place for petitionary prayer, uh, uh, proper petitionary prayer in this way. And uh, it's proper only when we don't really ask for anything, but we just kind of sort of try to um, make peace. Uh, with God no matter what happens. But is this really how people pray? Uh, is this really uh, what they do, what deeply really religious people do when they do pray to God about something? Just to make peace with uh, his will, to encourage themselves or not? Are they simply asking for God's grace to strengthen their faith so that they can endure whatever may come. This does not look right. Uh, and uh, I don't know if you're on Twitter, but uh, we who are on Twitter uh, and who follow uh, 
uh, Christians on Twitter, uh, there is a Catholic Twitter, Orthodox Twitter. Uh, you can see if you follow many people uh, who are believers, you can see that often they ask for prayers. And they say, please pray for my mother, uh, she's very sick, please pray for uh, uh, my, my son, uh, he's in the hospital, uh, pray for this, pray for that. They sometimes say, pray for me tomorrow, I have important uh, job interview, and sometimes they won't even disclose um, uh, disclose uh, 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 their, uh, what it is about, so they say, pray for my private intention. So people obviously do pray for things, and it's, uh, it seems that, that, that matter to them a lot, and they engage their Christian community to do so for them. When we go back in time, and when we go back in time to uh, this period of the late antiquity, uh, sixth century Gaza, uh, we will see that these kind of prayers are very common uh, for health, for um, uh, for, uh, for good outcome of uh, the uh, selling of the property or something like that. These prayers are just uh, regular. Um, and uh, uh, Phillips and Wittgenstein wouldn't really, uh, from uh, the 20th and 21st century, uh, approve of these prayers. But these are the prayers that uh, John and Barsanufius, two desert fathers, two holy men, approved uh, and encouraged among their uh, fellow Christians. So let me now say something about uh, their time. Uh, and their letters, and then we'll see uh, how, uh, why it was uh, okay for John and Barzanufius to pray in a particular way and to encourage peti petitionary prayer in which we ask for things, and that's something unexpected for Dizzy Phillips and Wittgenstein. Of course, it has to do with metaphysical confines and different worldviews of the pre-moderns and moderns that we started with. So they're enchanted in our disenchanted world. So, uh, and then we'll come back to that. John and Barsanufius were two holy men. Uh, they lived in, ah, this picture is so small, uh, but uh, this is from Mosaic, from Jordan, and uh, uh, the, the darker colors uh, on, the, on the left uh, is uh, Gaza, and there is a little, little spot to the right of it. Uh, it's Twarta Mo Monastery, and they lived there. Uh, they lived in the time of uh, Justinian. Uh, they left behind 800 letters, whole correspondences that are really something. Uh, we are really lucky to have them. Uh, these 800 letters are, uh, and exchanges are really uh, a wonderful insight into the way of early Christian uh, communities, the, how they lived, what they worried about. Uh, so I warmly recommend that they publish them, translated them into English, publish, publish them into huge volumes. Uh, now, about the time. We know uh, it's time of Justinian, uh, it's time at the beginning uh, of the prosperity, and then uh, Roman Empire at the time, uh, went further, regained some control of the, uh, uh, of the Western lands. Um, then, uh, during that time, uh, Justinian uh, ordered the ban uh, for pagans to participate in public services, uh, and this can actually be seen in the letters as well, because once he did that, many people wanted to convert to Christianity, uh, so they were in a rush to do so, and John and Barsanufius really had the advice how to go about that, uh, these rushed uh, 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 baptisms. Uh, now, this is the time also of the horrible Justinian plague uh, that killed many people and uh, was partially responsible for the quick decline of, of, the, of the empire. Uh, and the worries that people in these exchanges, people from Gaza, these are Christians from Gaza, uh, expressed to the, these two holy men questions they asked for uh, range uh, 
from theological matters and these two old men, uh, holy men, did not really like to talk a lot about theological matters, but they did respond to some. Uh, the questions were about the elections of bishops, so political matters. Uh, then people would ask about how to proceed in the marriage. Uh, then in their friendships, when they had some worries about how, what to do uh, uh, in their lives. Then how to sell property, to, who to, to whom to sell property, at what price. So it's a wonderful, wonderful set of worries that uh, we kind of uh, recognize ourselves uh, uh, from today, like in their in their uh, in their uh, letters, and of course the one uh, very prevalent uh, and that is of concern to us today is the worry about health, and that's where petitioner repair era really comes from. People were worried about uh, health of themselves, of their loved ones. So when somebody gets, and even for their animals. So when somebody gets sick, they would ask holy men what to do. In these letters, we will see that in their responses, we will see that they differentiated between uh, superstition, uh, uh, superstition, superstitious acts, and magical healings, proper medical healings, and the prayer that, uh, that can help us heal. Prayer to God to help us heal. So these are three kinds of healings. And of course, at the end of the day, uh, no healing happens if it's not God's will. So even if we go to see a doctor and apply the, the remedies that the regular doctor advises, uh, we won't heal if it's not God's, God's will. Now, let me just go to the first uh, 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 first letter, that's letter that, that we'll talk about today. The, in this letter, uh, letter 753, uh, one uh, man uh, is worried about his horse. And uh, his horse got sick and, uh, and uh, he's, he, he doesn't know how to heal the horse. So he asks uh, uh, John and Barsanufius to, to tell him uh, whether he can go to see the sorcerer so that the sorcerer can cast the spell so that the um, horse gets well. And uh, this is what uh, they respond, holy men respond. Magical spells are forbidden by God. And one should not resort to them at all, for they bring destruction to the soul through transgressing God's decree. Instead, bring your host to other forms of healing and therapy as proposed by veterinary doctors, the same as uh, doctors for, uh, for human beings. It's, uh, they recommend proper medical remedies. For this is certainly not sinful. Furthermore, sprinkle some holy water over it. Obviously, sprinkling holy water is not superstitious act. Uh, it's not magical act. Uh, uh, it's a hope that God will work his miracles through that act, through holy water. So that's one thing. The other one, in the other letter, uh, one man asks, should he uh, advise against going to the sorcerers, uh, other people? And the holy man respond and they say, well, if the man is uh, a Christian, tell him, uh, brother, you're harming my soul and angering God, who does not allow us to do this. And then the other uh, guy asks, well, uh, but what to do with pagans and uh, non-Christians? And they respond, well, if they're non-Christians, you don't have to advise them only if they ask for it. So then tell them what you think. So that's their stance on superstition. And of course, as I mentioned, miraculous healing through holy water, it's not magical, it's not medical. It's a proper kind of feeling, uh, healing. Now, prayers as the way to heal. They have set of letters about that. Uh, because people would ask them to pray for their recovery or recovery of their children. So in one letter, we have a sick man with high fever and uh, this man asks uh, a holy man to pray for him and to send him some holy water. 
and the man uh, uh, prays for him, the holy man prays for him, sends the holy water, and uh, the fever subsides. Now, the, the man who recovered goes around, tells everybody, brags to everybody how he recovered, how, how the holy man cured him, how God cured him, and he gets fever again. And then uh, holy man says, well, you, go, you don't go around bragging about that. You just don't do that. We'll, we'll repeat, but then be just silent. Don't be a chatterbox. So they repeat and he recovers. So that's one story of recovery. Now, there is another interesting exchange between holy man and one of the professors of philosophy in Gaza at the time. Uh, the professor had two sons, and uh, when his first son got sick, he asked the holy man to pray for his health and recovery, and uh, the, uh, the holy man said, don't worry, we'll pray and he'll recover. Uh, and that, that's what happened. But then the second son gets sick, and the holy man says, we shall pray, in his response, but it is up to God to have mercy on him. Therefore, cut off your own will and give thanks to him in all circumstances. Professor of philosophy doesn't really get this one properly. He thinks that this means that his son will recover, uh, but he doesn't. And at his deathbed, the son says to his father, Father, please stop praying for recovery of my body here in this world when the next world is ready for me. And, uh, uh, and he dies. After that, the uh, uh, professor of philosophy asks the holy man, why, why didn't you tell me, like, why did you send such a mixed message uh, and I hoped that he was going to live? Uh, and the holy man responds, well, look, uh, uh, sometimes God speaks to us through to me uh, through saints in a clear manner. Sometimes He speaks in not so clear manner, and it's not up to us to understand that and to understand why. Now, there is this concern when this petitionary prayer fails. So, uh, in another case, uh, another man asks for his health and the prayers, and John uh, uh, promises, the holy man promises that he's going to recover quickly, but he doesn't. Uh, and then uh, when he asks why, uh, John says to him, look, your faith is not strong enough. You go to the races. And now keep in mind, going to the races, to the Hippodrome at the time were, uh, was something for pagans, but not suitable for Christians. And then it, uh, it kind of uh, uh, signaled that his faith was not strong enough. Very shortly after that, we find the same man asking uh, John about his marriage. So we uh, realized that he recovered, but we don't find out whether whether he uh, stopped going to the races. So we don't know that. Now, finally, the huge crisis happened, also reflected in the letters um, uh, with the plague. Uh, and uh, this is the letter, letter 569, in which, uh, that, uh, uh, that was signed by all, uh, uh, all monks uh, in, the, in the community. Uh, and it's addressed to Barsanufius, and it says the following. Since the world is in danger, all of us entreat you as your servants to pray to God's goodness, so that he may lift his hand and return the sword to its seat. Stand upright among those who have fallen and who live with your holy incense and put an end to this destruction. Raise the holy altar on the holy threshing floor of Ornan in order that God's wrath may cease. We entreat you, indeed we implore you, have compassion on the world that is perishing. Remember that all of us are your members, display your compassion and God's wonders even in the present time. For this is the glory to the ages. Amen. To which Barsanufius responds, I, I am in a, a retreat, I am praying as much as I can for the world that is perishing, and I'm praying for our 
uh, that, uh, for God's mercy, but there are other three men uh, out there that are in better position to, know, uh, to, to, to pray to God uh, because they are better people than I am. Uh, one is in Rome, the other one is in Corinthus, and the third one is Jerusalem. Is in Jerusalem. They all are better than me. They can stand at the gate of heaven and plead to God to have mercy on us. So obviously, prayers uh, of good men uh, uh, can have the impact uh, on our world. And that's what these holy men simply presupposed. They took that, as, uh, as, uh, for, they took that for granted. So these are important points. There are many other letters as well they, uh, that can uh, illustrate the same points. But this is, this is something uh, to, to uh, have mind on. Early Christians believed in interventionist God. God can intervene in our human affairs. This is something that modern philosophers are really, really frightened of. They, they don't want the interventionist God. Um, these early Christians uh, also believed that prayer is not incantation. There is no uh, automaticity. It's so, not some kind of magical mechanism that will deliver desired results to us. Finally, we should have faith. If we don't have faith in God, it simply won't work. So our faith has to be strong enough. None of this will be uh, something that Wittgenstein or Dizzy Phillips would like. They would treat that as superstition. But it wasn't superstition back in the times of John and Barsanufius. Now, let's explore why, uh, for Wittgenstein and Phillips, uh, some things are superstition uh, that were not superstition, according to John and Barsanufius, or uh, in general, early Christians. And see how different our worlds are that we live in. So in pre-modern world, the world was uh, ordered, it was moral universe, it was guided by uh, supernatural natural forces, even though the distinction between supernatural and natural is uh, uh, difficult to make back in that time. But they believed that in this world there are all kinds of creatures uh, demons, angels, spiritual beings, that there is a constant fight over human soul in that world. Uh, this world is highly, highly meaningful, uh, and it's about good and bad, about goodness and evil, and the fight between the two. Um, now, superstition uh, for them uh, is when we ask hidden devilish sources to help us out. And we are not to do that because we are angering God. Now, this actually can work. If we invoke these evil powers, they can help us, but they will ruin our soul. So that's their world. In the modern world, none of that is possible. We are going, uh, uh, and none of, the, none of that exists. And we are going back to this enchantment, disenchantment distinction. Uh, our world is the world of natural laws, mechanical causation. Uh, this world is completely neutral, uh, indifferent uh, to uh, our lives. Uh, uh, there is no fight over good and evil in it, except for human beings. But the world in itself is indifferent to uh, what we do. Uh, and superstition because becomes the belief that we can invoke something outside of this physical universe to fix things in this physical universe. It becomes the belief in this faulty causal chain. And it will never work. So uh, uh, we 
we simply uh, we will say to people who are uh, trying to uh, uh, who are carrying the lucky charms to repel the sickness that their lucky charm is not working. What what works is uh, I don't know the mask or the, well it's a question whether masks are masks are working or not but uh, yeah masks or whatever doctors tell us. So superstition cannot work. In the old world it can, but it's harmful to our soul. Now, how did we end up with this kind of universe? There, in this, our universe, petitionary prayer, uh, interventionist God becomes superstition. This is the usual story. Uh, this is the story that we usually find in the textbooks, that we find uh, uh, at many places. Philo histories of philosophies, uh, uh, philosophy are full of that. Uh, and the story, even though mistaken and superficial, goes like this. Uh, we uh, reach the modernity uh, when we basically gave up the Aristotelian four causes and accepted only one of his causes to explain all the phenomena in the world. So what are these Aristotelian causes? We all know them. Okay, so we have uh, material cause. Uh, that's the, uh, the stuff that the thing is made of. So the desk is made of wood, let's say. Then we have the final cause. Final cause is what this thing is for, the purpose of it. Uh, dining, serving dishes is the purpose of the table. Uh, formal cause is actually the, uh, in, an, in essence, what makes thing that thing. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's the nature of that thing. And here we have the shape uh, of uh, the desk is what makes the desk desk. So it can, it can, we can put food on it. A ball cannot be desk. Okay. And finally, we have official cause. These are all the forces that we pulled to make this thing at the end. So uh, uh, all the instruments that cut, that uh, polish, do, uh, and that eventually make the, uh, the desk or the table. Now, efficient cause is usually uh, explained, and philosophers know that, uh, by uh, this example of billiard, bo bo uh, billiard balls. And uh, the idea is that uh, everything, when you hit the billiard ball, you, you can, uh, the, the force with which you uh, hit and the, the tra uh, can explain the trajectory trajectory and then uh, how the other balls are moving and so on and so forth. So uh, the idea is that this efficient causation exemplified in these billiard balls can actually be used to explain every single thing in the universe. Dead matter, uh, uh, living matter, uh, growth, uh, not just basic physics but also physiological processes, biological processes, that basically the whole universe can be explained by these basic interactions between uh, uh, basic elements, uh, and that's the only proper scientific explanation there is. Now, the story goes that that uh, it started to, uh, in the, uh, the, the, this uh, kind of uh, abandon, uh, abandonment of these Aristotelian four causes started in the 15th, 16th century, that Francis Bacon was one of the first to uh, entirely skip the final clause, uh, final uh, cause, a formal cause and material cause he kept, but nonetheless reformulated the in the way that it can be expressed as the efficient cause, and so on and so forth. Descartes is the famous one uh, to uh, be called uh, uh, as a philosopher of mechanistic uh, philosophy, uh, who gave up on other causes as well. And that's how uh, that became the most popular view. 
Now, these are some implications of this switch from uh, many causes uh, to one and only uh, mechanical causation. First one is that the whole world starts to be basically physical. There are no spiritual beings, no souls in it. So this, this disenchantment, uh, Max Weber's disenchantment starts there. No spirits, no soul, and eventually no God. For a while they tolerated God as a being who made, made this thing and left it. But he's not intervening. So they tolerated transcendent God, but not interventionist God. So no, no. Uh, uh, it doesn't make sense to, to offer petitionary prayer to such God. Until God disappeared altogether. Uh, because we didn't need him, need him anymore uh, for this world to function. So basically, uh, uh, he, uh, uh, the atheism became the most popular um, position among philosophers at the, uh, at the end of the 19th and 20th century uh, uh, altogether. As I mentioned, uh, the world, this in, disenchanted world is a neutral place. It's not good, not bad, uh, has no value to it whatsoever. Uh, and most philosophers started treating um, a religion as uh, superstition entirely, like all religion, all faith is just superstition. It's just belief in some mythical forces that don't exist at all. None of that exists. So praying is just worthless. It's just you, you, you are being superstitious if you're doing it. Um, people like Wittgenstein um, tried to make some kind of compromise. And uh, Wittgenstein uh, thought that if he could leave the world, natural world, world to sciences uh, and their explanations um, and their work, that maybe he can keep uh, good and bad, beauty and ugly, ugliness, uh, uh, fate in God uh, uh, outside. They don't interfere with the world, they don't explain it, they don't do anything in this world, but they're the ones who give our life meaning. They shape our life, otherwise um, um, uh, we, are, we are left without anything to live for. So they saw, uh, he saw them as very important for our lives. Even though they don't explain the world, nor interfere with the world. Now, it's interesting. When we read modern historians, inspired but by our worldview, when they go in time and uh, write about and investigate the early Christianity, period of early Christianity, they tend to explain uh, the rise of saints, for example, uh, uh, petitionary prayers, magical healings, all that was important for the time, for the people of the time, they explain uh, as superstitious popular folk belief. And that's something that Peter Brown, uh, when he was researching the rise of the saints in 1981, noticed uh, the famous uh, historian of late antiquity. Um, he said, uh, look, uh, they treat the belief in saints, uh, saints and magical healing as superstition, but that wasn't superstition for the people of the time. And why they do it? They say these historians are coming from the so-called two-tier model of fate uh, that was inspired and started by Hume uh, in his natural history of religion, uh, where he said that people mostly are not really capable of uh, forming the proper concept of God. And uh, that's why they need kind of uh, these stories of saints, materialized saints, to do miracles for them right here and now, um, to help them with harvest and whatnot. Uh, and they're just superstitious. 
these people are superstitious. The proper concept of God is reserved for philosophers, theologians, those who can actually think about abstract uh, things. Now, this is all very funny uh, uh, when you think of it, because, uh, because Christianity in itself, uh, I mean, uh, 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 lies, its foundation, its heart lies in the fact that uh, God uh, 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 incarnated in the flesh uh, to, so that we can become God, so that God himself came and walked among us to save us. So it's interesting that uh, they wanted to treat Christianity as if it, it was some, some sort of platonic God they advocated for, but it's not. So uh, Phillips uh, uh, cites another philosopher, William James, to explain what he thinks about proper faith and superstition. And uh, this is a nice quote, and I'll read it with you. Uh, so he says, the refined supernaturalists deny that the supernatural can in any way interfere with the course of events in the natural world. So that's what we were talking about all the way, uh, all the time uh, during this lecture. The world of the ideal God, who is transcendent over there, never bursts into the phenomenal world at particular points. In contrast to that, so that's the proper view of God. In contrast to this, the crassier variety, which has a huge following among the uneducated, admits miracles and providential endings and finds no intellectual difficulty in mixing the ideal and real worlds together by inter interpolating influences from the ideal region among the forces that causally determine the real world's details. Uh, and here we see, we see uh, the, the, whoever believes in this is un, unsophisticated, uneducated, and he's superstition, uh, superstitious, and uh, the educated know that the transcendent God cannot interfere. Van Herk, one of the philosophers, said to Phillips when he was defending petitionary prayer, he said, well, but people who pray, believers, are, do not really care uh, whether their worldview is consistent or not. So just let them be. Don't impose your prayer or your view of prayer on them. To which Phillips says, well, obviously you, you, you're patronizing uh, them now uh, instead of trying to teach everybody to pray properly, meaning not to ask for things, not to believe in interventionist God. Um, you're just leaving the ignorant to be ignorant, and that's not nice. But both of them actually tr are trying to accommodate petitionary prayer to our modern worldview, uh, which is, as we have seen, barren, the world is barren, empty, uh, nothing to hope for, nothing to pray for there, uh, indifferent to us. Now, we may ask at the end, are there alternatives to our modern barren worldview? Um, and at first glimpse, it seems that there are none. Why? Because obviously, this kind of worldview, that's uh, the usual assumption, uh, gave us industrial revolution. We have computers, we have uh, antibiotics, we have uh, light, uh, electrical light. We have all those things due to this worldview, or so the story goes. And uh, Hamby, in this nice article, uh, who argues against John Milbank, uh, he says, uh, this, this worldview uh, of ours that is barren, uh, we, we don't have to assume it's true or it's false. Well, as long as it works and it gave us all this. So uh, we'll just stick to it uh, because we must. Uh, that's progress. But is it really that the case? And these are just some ideas that I will uh, give you and that we can think about them. First, there is no really reason to believe that there is direct link between metaphysical views, overarching metaphysical views, and technological progress. Uh, and we would need to go case by case in history to see 
what inspired what uh, when it comes to inventions and technological progress. Now, obviously, different metaphysics can inspire, can inspire some different uh, experiments. So, in the, again, back to the 16th century, Gaza, uh, not Gaza this time, but Alexandria, uh, we find alchemists uh, who were using Aristotelian metaphysics uh, and tried to come up uh, with the ways to make gold. The idea was that we have this pre, uh, prima materia, um, uh, at the basis of all things, that's the material cause, if you remember, and then uh, they tried to devoid these uh, uh, objects, several, uh, some objects, of all the properties these objects have, and then to add properties, desirable property, properties to this prima materia, and make gold in this way. So, obviously, different metaphysics can inspire some kind of experiments. Now, uh, technological progress uh, can inspire metaphysics and not vice versa. So uh, just uh, think about how every time we make something, some, some instrument, something, we automatically start thinking about ourselves in, the, in terms of this latest technology. So when they made the clock, they said, oh, our mind is just like the clock. So we have sort of metaphysical view of mind right away from the technology that we developed. Now we think about mind as a computer or uh, 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 networks of computers or something. Um, and finally, it's really important to, uh, to have in mind that uh, uh, this reductive metaphysics of our modern times did not win because it was uh, better or true or something. It won uh, over other alternative, more enchanted metaphysics. Uh, because of all kinds of things, social, cultural, economic. And John Milbank, in a wonderful book, uh, it's a collection of essays, uh, Beyond Science and Religion, uh, cited all these, uh, these uh, uh, factors that contributed uh, to, uh, to uh, the winning of this reductive metaphysics. So we can, uh, according to Milbank, and I agree with him, we can imagine uh, modernity uh, within alternative uh, metaphysics, so more enchanted metaphysics. We can have progress and other non-reductive uh, metaphysics simultaneously. And finally, again, thoughts to think about. Um, our contemporary sciences, especially biology, uh, life sciences, ecology, uh, are uh, telling us that uh, reductive explanations uh, that would involve only uh, bottom-up explanations from the basic particles, their interactions, and upward, are not good enough to explain phenomena of life. Uh, and uh, many people wrote about that, like Susan Ayama, Evan Thompson, uh, people from, who are doing uh, developmental biology, uh, but also cognitive science, uh, and they insisted that uh, something like top-down uh, causation, downward causation, is something that scientists need to explain the phenomenon of life. This is non-reductive, Kind of, uh, uh, kind of causation, and it breaks away from this reductive metaphysics that we learn to live with. So uh, in that case, uh, we can have some tentative conclusion uh, here uh, that if our science, best sciences tell us that we need richer metaphysics, and maybe even the re introduction of some of Aristotelian causes, like formal cause. Uh, maybe there is then place for uh, petitionary prayer, for uh, God, uh, interventionist God, uh, not only transcendent one, but interventionist as well. And maybe petitionary prayer makes sense with that caveat that we started with, that uh, only if it's according to God's will, not uh, just our wish. And finally, 
whatever our metaphysics, current metaphysics, we should kind of stick to this epistemological humility and say we don't want to impose metaphysical constraints on the way people pray because we really don't know whether this current metaphysics is uh, the correct one and the only one. And uh, I will end with that. Uh, this uh, lecture is put together from two uh, pieces that I've been working on uh, for, for a long time now. Uh, one is published in Social Epistemology, uh, Epistemology Review and the Reply Collective on Petitionary Prayer, and the other one uh, is uh, with uh, uh, Petr Nulkic, uh, the, and we submitted it, and it's under the review, under review so we are hoping we'll uh, find the proper place for that piece there. And the final slide is thank you. Uh, I have a question that is more of a comment, and my question will be, what do you think about my comment? <laughs> and uh, I think that my question is uh, uh, about enchant enchant enchantedness and disenchantedness. Uh, so when I think about suffering, uh, we can be modest regarding suffering. You, uh, if we suffer, maybe we think there is a... a, a structure that is similar for all kinds of suffering or essence or whatnot. I think that uh, intervention, God's intervention in our stance toward it and enchantedness and disenchantedness is uh, tied up with uh, a different kind of suffering. So we have emus and gods. Uh, uh, God people think that the uh, world is horrible and everything is wrong with the world but I'm okay, you know. But emo people think everything is wrong with me and the world is like that and I, I need to change myself. So if I'm suffering as an emo, I uh, would wish uh, for God to give me strength to deal with the world. Mm -hmm. But if, if I'm uh, God, I will think, you know, uh, destroy this world, scorch it, you know, and uh, I'm leaning more towards uh, uh, petitionary, uh, no, no, uh, towards, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think that God will intervene. This is a God's deed, uh, world that, like this, but if I'm an uh, uh, internalist regarding suffering, I will uh, think that God can intervene and give me strength to deal with the world. And I think in the other sense, and that's my comment. Mm -hmm. What do you think about, you know, disenchantedness and suffering and the relationship between mm -hmm. the two? Okay, uh, one little comment about what you said uh, about emo uh, position. So uh, I'm suffering and I uh, pray uh, to God to give me strength. Uh, even for uh, Dizzy Phillips, uh, that would be proper way uh, to pray. Uh, and the reason why is that, is that in that case you do not really ask for the external causation uh, to happen, uh, but uh, it's uh, uh, you are in that call for God. You are growing in your faith from within. Uh, um, uh, you you ask for the change of the heart, and there is no causality there. So he would say this. Uh, so, so when we go back to Wittgenstein's prayer, uh, the one that he, uh, that he prayed during the war, where he says, "God, give give me, please give me uh, strength." Uh, that's this proper kind of internal prayer that does not require external intervention. Uh, by the very act, you grow your faith and, get, uh, and you're getting closer to God. So you grow your love for God in that prayer and you ask for change of heart. Nothing really uh, causally is there. Uh, but in the other case, when you ask for things outside, that's all banned. <laughs> for them. Uh, so uh, heal the world or uh, for, for Phillips, of, of course, heal the world, heal the people or destroy the world and punish them, have mercy or punish them. Uh, 
uh, these are the requests uh, that require intervention is God, uh, the one that Philips and Wittgenstein do not believe in, uh, but obviously uh, John and Barsanufius did. Uh, so, uh, uh, and that was the example of the plague. Uh, uh, pray for us so that God uh, save us from this uh, horrible illness. Uh, and uh, so um, for them, that's not superstition. That's not, uh, in their world, this kind of miracle uh, is something that is taken for granted. That's possible. Uh, uh, I don't know whether I commented properly. <laughs> okay. Any more comments or questions? Yes. Thank you, Lily, for this uh, this lecture. Uh, I uh, heard uh, many of these ideas in our personal conversations. Yes, in the in 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 the last year and before that. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, one thing at least uh, uh, came for the first time to 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 my mind uh, when you. Uh, uh, we're uh, talking about uh, Wittgenstein and uh, Collins, which I uh, don't know uh, very very well. Yes, but uh, uh, my uh, w w what I uh, m the idea that came to to me is that uh, they both, at the first glance, that they both uh, are very good uh, student of ancient ancient. Uh, uh, thinkers, uh, for example, uh, the sentence you uh, put on uh, uh, on uh, your, your presentation uh, by it, by Wittgenstein is it is it, uh, the distinction between superstition and uh, real faith, uh, religious faith, is something that uh, can be uh, said by. Uh, Many ancient philosophers, uh, especially, but by Plutarch. Plutarch is the only, uh, the only uh, ancient philosopher who uh, left behind uh, one essay, uh, particularly devoted to uh, superstition. Yes, and uh, uh, what he said, uh, it is the distinction: uh, religious faith and superstition, uh, uh, trust and fear. Trust and fear. This, the, these distinctions are actually is, is is the ex of the of the idea on superstition by expressed by Plutarch. Uh, similarly, uh, Collins uh, had some uh, some uh, ideas uh, that are uh, uh, that uh, prayer is not. Uh, the prayer is not when you asking for something particular, if I understand uh, well, but that it is expression of our devotion, devotion to, to God. It is something, something, something like this. Uh, both of these, uh, uh, I think that they, what they uh, were, uh, were trying to do is to clean, to purify uh, faith from superstition. And it is a very good idea. And uh, I, at the first glance, like uh, their, uh, their opinions very, very much. From the other hand, uh, and in doing so, uh, they, um, they're making, uh, consciously maybe, uh, a faith uh, rather abstract. And uh, God uh, made rather abstract. They uh, removed them uh, from reality from people's life and that's why uh, it is not in accordance with it is not in accordance i think with something with christian 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 faith uh, because it is uh, um, all all these distinctions are very very subtle very fine and it is difficult to find but uh, what is christian in my and you said a lot of examples that uh, goes in that that uh, that direction is that uh, we uh, 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 that uh, our wish should be in accordance with God's will, and our uh, uh, our will uh, we, we should not destroy our will, personal will, maybe. But uh, what we should do is uh, to to make our will subject to to God's will. Yeah, and in that case, uh, you are uh, free to. To pray for uh, for anything you wish, your wish should be uh, clean on on every, and uh, you should protect, uh, you should uh, be careful that uh, you, uh, you you sh should not accept the 
of some other supernatural things like demons or something to you you should uh, the, uh, and in that case in that case it is it is okay so uh, Wittgenstein uh, and Collins, uh, if I, uh, Phillips, if I, if Phillips, uh, I think that uh, they had one good idea, and because the superstition is really around us, in, in including church, of course, in many things, uh, but uh, the, what, what, many subtle, very subtle distinctions should be should be made for this. Yeah, yeah. I, I uh, thank you very much for the comment, and I uh, really agree. Uh, and what I didn't really, and I had that in mind uh, yesterday, that I should really make that explicit or to know that because it's really. Uh, and then I forgot uh, while I was talking. But the thing is that uh, what Phillips and uh, uh, and Wittgenstein uh, say uh, uh, about uh, uh, fear and trusting and uh, how we should ask for the change of our heart and the, the, all of that uh, uh, goes well with what Desert Fathers say, the, what, 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 with the, with the, uh, that uh, uh, prayer on the Mount, uh, Mount of Olives. That, that really goes nicely there. But what they do uh, they do an extra step. Uh, uh, this one is uh, the same as in the Christian tradition, uh, uh, the understanding of the prayer. But they do this extra step when they introduce uh, the metaphysics, uh, whether uh, that prayer is possible or impossible due to meta specific, uh, specific metaphysics. And then they say, well, this is natural wor world. It doesn't, uh, you cannot ask for anything to intervene from above and make the changes in the natural world. This natural world is somehow physically enclosed and so on. So they import this uh, metaphysics into their view. So this is that sort of, it may look as if they are in line with what uh, Desert Fathers said or Church Fathers. Uh, and, uh, but then on the other hand, they, they did make this extra step uh, that early Christians didn't care about. Uh, I mean, for their miracles were possible, and God could help you uh, if, his, if it's his will. So they didn't have this metaphysical obstacle that uh, uh, these guys introduced because they had to, for some, because we have this science now and progress and technology, and all that is somehow based uh, on this view, particular view of world as uh, uh, dead, inert, uh, neutral uh, matter. So that uh, so and that's that that addition is that I'm quarreling with because I think that uh, 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 it's I don't know uh, 300 year, uh, years old and uh, even scientists tell us we have to move on and kind of enrich it. Now we reduced it to particles, but now we have to enrich it. Something like that. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you.